It's the end of June 1462 and the Ottoman army is met with an eerie silence as it marches into the town of Targoviste in Romania. Someone has been here before them. His name is Vlad Dracula. The Ottomans move cautiously through the streets, wondering all the time where the people are. There are no kids playing, no men hard at work, just empty houses and the odd wandering dog, and then they see it. A sight so chilling it almost brings them to their knees. Before them stands a forest of the impaled. For hundreds of feet, around 20,000 people are impaled on stakes. Not only the men, but also the women and children too. One man has to look away as he sees a woman and her infant impaled on the same stake. A bird has made a nest where their guts used to be. This is unforgivable. What we just described to you was written by the Byzantine Greek chronicler Launikos Kalkokondilis and was part of the ten books he wrote known as the Histories. It described the diabolical nature of the man we know today as Vlad the Impaler, certainly not the only man in history fond of impaling his enemies, but perhaps the best known for this hideous form of execution. Today we'll talk about impaling throughout history and we'll also explain how it was done and why it was done. The why part might surprise you. You can read many old texts that were written in parts of Europe that describe Vlad's utter brutality, but historians tell us to be cautious in regard to what we believe because some stories may have been exaggerated. Still, not many people disagree that Vlad was described as a demented psychopath, a sadist, a gruesome murderer, and a masochist. He certainly tortured people and he certainly impaled people, but as some people point out, he did so to put the fear of God into his enemies and retain order among his people. He might not have actually nailed turbans to men's head or executed women for being lazy, and maybe not all the legends that are written about Vlad the Impaler are true, but there's no doubt he impaled a lot of people during his reign. He wasn't the first person to do it either, and people did it for a long time after Vlad took his last breath. In fact, folks were impaled not so long ago, but let's now go back in time to ancient history. If you look at something called the Code of Hammurabi, an ancient Babylonian law book that dates back to around 1772 BC, you'll see that impalement was the sentence handed down to a woman who'd killed a man for another man. Law number 153 states this, if a woman brings about the death of her husband for the sake of another man, they shall impale her. We found other texts relating to laws in the ancient Near East that talk about impaling, but it seems in some areas all the woman had to do was cheat on her husband and she could get impaled, while prisoners of war or people who were accused of certain sins could also face the same fate. Later in time it happened during the Neo-Assyrian Empire. We know this from statues and carvings that depict impaling. There are some descriptions too. Over 800 years before Christ was born, a Neo-Assyrian king named King Ashurnaspiral II wrote about his handiwork. I cut off their hands. I burned them with fire. A pile of the living men and of heads over against the city gate I set up, men impaled on stakes, and the city I destroyed and devastated. I turned it into mounds and ruin heaps, the young men and the maidens and the fire I burned." The reason a king might do this, of course, was to instill terror in people. Seeing a bunch of people being impaled on stakes acted as a deterrent to anyone else thinking about becoming a rebel. Centuries later, Darius the Great, the king of Persia, was said to have impaled 3,000 Babylonians when he conquered Babylon. In an inscription, this is how he explained what he did to a rebel. I cut off his nose and ears and tongue and put out one eye. He was kept bound at my palace entrance, all the people saw him. Afterward, I impaled him at Ekbatana, and the men who were his foremost followers, those at Ekbatana within the fortress, I flayed and hung out their hides stuffed with straw. Ok, so it seems to have happened a lot in ancient times. It's also referenced in the Bible, although some translations use hanging and others use impalement so there are disagreements there. As for those torture-loving ancient Romans, while they seem to derive enjoyment from the whole gamut of creative punishments, there is little written about impalement in the ancient Roman texts. It seems to have happened from time to time, but the Romans preferred crucifixion to impalement, a punishment that could last a lot longer. Let's remember, while impalement was horrific, once that stake was driven through the body, the victim will usually die very quickly. Well, in most cases. As you'll see, impalement could be a slow process at times. Now let's talk about transversal impalement, something we haven't touched on yet. There are quite a few mentions of this in the old German texts from the late Middle Ages. Similar to some Assyrian laws from ancient times, it seems as if women in parts of Germany were accused of killing her own child, she could be impaled. What was different from the Assyrian way of doing it is rather than the person being mounted on a stake, the stake was driven through the victim. There's evidence dating back to the 14th century that tells us a woman and a man accused of adultery could be impaled this way. 
They would be tied together and placed on the ground or in a grave, and a stake would be driven through the both of them, a kind of symbolic execution as it meant the cheaters would stay together forever. In 1340, there exists a German law code that said the husband of the woman who has cheated on him with another man can make a choice, that is, collect some cash as compensation or have the couple tied down. He is then handed the hammer with which he'll drive the stake through his wife and her lover. Staying with Germany, laws were written in the 1500s that stated if a woman killed her own child, the usual punishment would be drowning, but in some cases she might be buried alive and a stake would be driven right through her heart. It seemed around that same time this punishment was also sometimes reserved for women accused of being witches. Transversal impalement was certainly no walk in the park for the victim, but we think longitudinal impalement was worse. As described, the former is having a stake pushed through a person's middle, mostly their chest. The latter is having the stake pushed through the length of the person's body. How exact this was we can't be sure, but in some cases the perfect longitudinal impalement would be if the stake entered the anus and came out through the chest. Yeah, a stake through the heart would beat that any day of the week. As you know, this punishment often happened to rebels or prisoners of war. It was a statement used by Vlad the Impaler more than anyone else, but it happened all across Europe. One thing it was used for was when a person defected to another army or collaborated with the enemy possibly the worst crime in the eyes of the country you were fighting for. There are instances of it happening a few times when local people just provided food for soldiers. Those locals were captured by the other side and then accused of helping the enemy. Only the most extreme punishment was handed down to them. In Western Europe, it seemed to be the Germans that were particularly fixated on this form of punishment. Not only did they do it to rebels, but they also impaled people who'd been accused of robbery. One book it's mentioned in doesn't state what kind of robbery, but it's likely the victims had been accused of stealing from the state. Impalement might also happen to people who'd been accused of committing the very worst kind of crimes against one's own community. Let's take murderers, for instance. They might have been beheaded or even had their bodies broken on the wheel, but some lawmakers saw this as getting off lightly, especially when they were serial killers. We might take the case of a man named Pavel Vashansky. He was a prolific highway robber in the 1500s who worked in today's Czech Republic. He not only stole cash and valuables from the people he robbed, but he often killed them in the process. When he was arrested, he confessed to 124 murders, which made him a very active killer. His punishment was definitely commensurate to the crime, if he actually committed those crimes. Police work back then was somewhat sketchy. First, they cut off his limbs, then while he was still breathing they took a pair of red-hot pincers and removed his nipples. Only then was he impaled on a stake. For good measure, they set him on fire. We should say that in those days when you admitted to a number of murders, you weren't doing so in the name of a plea deal, you were more often than not tortured before you admitted your guilt. We found another case, this time in Germany, that involved a man that went by the name of Peter. He killed 30 people, and some of those were pregnant women. He'd done this because he wanted the unborn babies. He thought if he ate them, he would gain the power of invisibility. Such were the times. People were quite superstitious. We guess Pushpeter found out the hard way that his invisibility medicine didn't quite work. There's a legend about this man which involves him telling off his executioner for not doing the impalement correctly. According to this legend, he told the executioner to take him down and do it again, this time hitting the right spot. Is that true? According to the book History of the German People at the Close of the Middle Ages, they first took off one of his hands with red-hot pincers, then dragged him through the town, but there's no mention of the botched execution. What's interesting in this book is that it recounts many crimes and punishments in Germany in the mid to late 1500s, and it seems a lot of people were executed for civil crimes, but they were usually beheaded or hanged. The book explains that the authorities only tortured people who'd been accused of the worst kind of crimes. The torture itself was weighted against the strength of a person. If the person looked tough, the torture was more brutal. The torture was not recorded, but the confession was. After that, the torture stopped. The accused was never asked again about the torture and only had to confirm in court his confession. We told you, police work was sketchy in those days. Ok, back to impalement and the last times it was employed as a punishment. During the 17th and 18th centuries, people were impaled throughout the Ottoman Empire. The punishment was again seen as the worst of the worst and only reserved for the worst kind of criminal. It didn't happen often, but when it did, it was usually highway robbers who were laid on the stake. Apparently, the last time the Ottomans impaled highway robbers was in the late 1830s, so when you consider it was happening in 1772 BC, impalement was punishment with legs. It also happened to Christians who'd been accused of speaking against Islam or having a love affair with a Muslim woman. According to the writer Jean de Thiveneau, the man could convert to Islam and get out of the impalement. In the early 19th century, the Ottoman government also did this to Greek bandits that had become rebels. 
They'd be taken to a place where the entire village or town could see and be impaled there as a message to anyone else thinking about rebelling. Even if you were accused of giving food to a rebel or offering one shelter, you might also get impaled. And it gets worse. Sometimes those rebels would have parts chopped off them before being impaled. They might also be flayed beforehand. On occasion, the person would be impaled and then held over a fire and roasted to death. The Greek War of Independence then broke out in 1821, and during that war, a lot of Greeks found themselves on the wrong end of the stake. Around 65 Greeks were impaled during the Constantinople Massacre, something which was a retaliation for the war breaking out. It happened to 30 more Greeks on the island of Zakynthos. In various parts of Greece, even women, older people, and monks were impaled from time to time during this bloody war. We've talked about this next method of impalement before, so we'll make it short. This is a method known as bamboo torture, and it's simple. Bamboo is hard as hell and grows very, very fast. Tie a man over a chute and he will slowly be impaled on it. There are records of this happening in Thailand, India, and where the Japanese held prisoners of war in the Pacific. This might not seem so brutal, but what would be better? being thrown onto the stake or having one slowly work its way through your body. Two other slow methods of impalement both around the 18th century involved the use of hooks. One of them, sometimes called sengala, was very slow and very painful. A man would be fastened to a hook that was placed right below his ribcage. The hook would then be pulled up until it pulled open his chest. This was used by the Ottomans and it was also a punishment for rebel slaves in Dutch Suriname. A name for this punishment is hanged by the ribs. Yet another form of impalement happened from time to time in Algeria in the 18th century. It was simple, painful, and slow. Hooks were fixed into city walls and men were thrust upon these hooks, howling out in pain for everyone to see. Now check out Worst Punishments the Upright Jerker, or have a look at this. 